So, welcome to the um, fifth, uh, the fourth episode of series five of Entangled Discussions. Back with a bang, uh, back with a big bang, quantum and space. For those who are new to the talks, we're a friendly, inclusive group, and we encourage interaction. So please use the chat box for any questions or observations along the way. And for those comfortable taking the mic, there will be an opportunity uh, to join the conversation and ask questions later during the discussion. Um, these talks are recorded and will go on to our Entangled Discussions YouTube channel um, and be shared on LinkedIn. Um, we are changing the way we administer these talks slightly, so please follow Entangled Positions on LinkedIn to ensure you stay up to date with uh, all future talks. Um, so today, we're fortunate to have a guest that's able to have one foot um, reaching scientific heights in the space, quantum and AI, AI arenas, amongst others, um, whilst also keeping her other foot firmly on the floor as a strong ethical advocate working towards shaping an equi equitable, diverse, collaborative scientific community. Um, after we met at the recent UK Quantum, uh, KTN UK Quantum Showcase, um, I'm excited to say that I've no idea how we're going to fit so many possible topics into one talk. Um, and I'm therefore delighted to introduce Dr. Sonali Mahopatra of Craft, Craft Prospects. John, really, really looking forward to being here and talking. Perfect. And um, th th there's so many, as, as I mentioned, there's so many things I'm looking forward to discussing today. So um, could we start by hearing a little bit more about yourself and your work? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was, that was a really good introduction, the way you said one foot on AI space quantum and one foot on equitable. I might, I might feel that actually. You're more than welcome. <laughs> Um, okay, so since we have a little bit of a time, let me like do like a proper introduction. I usually just keep to the academic side of things when you're doing talks or you know academic discussions. Um, so um, yeah, so I guess uh, I started off being really, really curious and interested in space uh, since I was a kid. Um, and then I used to, pretend to be working on black holes when I was in seventh grade. Uh, used to go cut newspaper articles and then put that in a folder, still have that folder. This was like pre-internet, right? Pre-internet, pre-computers, you know, everyone having a personal computer at home. Um, and I also, I, I think the first book that I got as a, um, like a, a gift or not exactly a gift. I won in a science exhibition uh, in which I was not supposed to take part in the, fir uh, in the first place, but I won that science exhibition and we got this book called, I think it was about robots and artificial intelligence in space. And I think that, that was the beginning of like, you know, when I started to dream about space. Um, and after that, I basically like, I got lucky. Uh, there was a time after my 10th, 11th, 12th grade in India, uh, when they were really starting to drive uh, basic science research. And so they had introduced quite a lot of scholarships for students of various different backgrounds. And I won the scholarship known as a um, young, uh, young Scientist Encouragement Fellowship, roughly translated. And that basically covered uh, my undergraduate and master's in Indian education of science education and research. So those are uh, five to seven, I think maybe eight, now research hubs that were set up by the government of India during that time to push forward basic sciences research. And I think that was the beginning of everything because that uh, model, which allowed us to have basic sciences interdisciplinary research in the first three years, we did engineering, we did uh, basic sciences in maths, physics, chemistry, biology, artificial intelligence, programming. You know, I even built my own solar cell. I built a artificial intelligence program, which would teach computers how to learn rules based on how young children uh, minds work uh, and educational models like that. And then after some time, I figured out that no, I, I'm still pretty interested in black holes. Uh, and then I found my way to Caltech uh, where I did this undergraduate research program. And I was one of the 25 researchers working on the prototype interferometer that uh, LIGO had uh, built. And I was working on instrumentation and how do you lock both of the arms of the interferometer to exact frequencies to detect gravitational waves. Um, from experiments from this, then I kind of took a roundabout way to come to theory again. So since I was doing optics, I then went and worked in another Indian lab in how do we use optics and light scattering techniques to detect cancer? 
uh, without any invasive technology. And that was also quite, quite an interesting project. And then I figured out, no, I really wanted to just pursue doing uh, theory for some more time. So I did my master's, uh, first master's thesis in um, loop quantum gravity, which is a kind of quantum gravity theory that you do to understand what happens inside of black holes, what happens at very, very, very tiny length scales in our universe. Uh, that was combining quantum and gravitational theories. Uh, from there, I went on to Perimeter Institute in Canada, which is for their master's and PhD program. The master's program is widely known as the toughest boot camp of physicists. I knew that, but you never know how tough it's going to be. It was tough, let me tell you that. And it was minus 55 degrees Celsius, and I was coming from plus 45 degrees Celsius. So it was better, better for shock, to say the least. Um, but I think that was a very, very good program in terms of taking my confidence level high. I did a, a master's project again in string theory, and I had amazing role models and mentors. Uh, and then I decided, okay, I've had one year of really cold temperatures. Um, I'm going to try and move somewhere else and not do my PhD there. So I, I had my offer from Sussex. I also had some offers from Nottingham and Oxford, but this was a fully funded scholarship. And also I kind of looked at, I drew a graph of which, which places I have an offer of, which have the highest number of sunny days in a year and Brighton was the one what I hadn't realized was sunny days are not not always not cold <laughs> so found myself in University of Sussex uh, doing research on again uh, um, um, effective theories of quantum gravity looking at black holes looking at how do we detect quantum signatures coming out of black holes that might be carried away in form of gravitational waves when two black holes uh, collide and merge together and let out energies. Um, after I finished my PhD, around that time, I was doing a lot of work in e e uh, equality, diversity, inclusion as part of the Athena Swan uh, umbrella uh, organization uh, in the UK. Uh, I was also consulting at the same time with multiple different organizations all over the world as a consultant to figure out, uh, to kind of like give a big picture of how does everything connect, connect to each other? Why is there a leaky pipeline? Why are these kind of symptomatic problems that we see in the in our society occurring? What are what are the causal uh, relationship between tiny little things like office temperature, for example, and then it might lead to you having a skewed gender balance in the workplace. Um, and then after that, I kind of figured out that I wanted to go into I can't touch black holes. It's going to be another 10, 100 to 200 years, hopefully, before we can kind of like, you know, go near a black hole. So I decided to kind of jump into accessible space uh, and brought the quantum expertise into uh, into the space sector. Uh, that's how I found my place in Craft Prospect. I was leading the quantum vertical, co-leading the quantum vertical with one of my colleagues who is who also is amazing. She was doing uh, Mars rovers before in NASA, and then now she's building quantum stuff at Craft. Um, so we were working together from an engineering perspective, her and me from a scientific perspective, and we set up the first uh, test bench uh, to demonstrate quantum key distribution uh, from satellites and craft. And right now I have then moved on to a position of doing more business development, as well as uh, kind of as somebody who understands both AI, quantum and space, and then also understands business development and kind of bridge the gap between the technical and the commercial by doing a lot of product development, strategy, um, commercialization, social media, um, and also like proposal writing, conceptualization of ideas across these three different verticals. Um, at the same time, um, as John was saying, in the equality diversity sector, because I feel very passionately about this, and I have a lot of background in the sector, I am the chair of the New Voices in Space Committee of Space Scotland, which used to be called SSLC previously, um, and we are going to uh, roll out the equality diversity inclusion guidance pack for companies and startups, uh, whichever stage of your growth you are in, what are the top things you should be keeping in mind? What are the very practical tips that you can uh, implement in your workplaces and so on? Um, and I'm on the board of Q India as well, uh, hoping to uh, kind of helping uh, Rishi and the wider team there um, drive uh, quantum literacy up in India, as well as globally all of the world, kind of like connecting different people, minds and expertises. So that's kind of my story till now, I think. <laughs> So um, where to start? <laughs> so I, I suppose the um, the obvious that the, the, the if there is an obvious place to start would be um, you kind of alluded to this, but um, 
with with all of the different skills that you've you've developed and um, um, attributes that, that you clearly have, why space and quantum? I think I've just always been really interested in something that seemed fantastical or just out of our reach. And anything that challenged me excited me. And so space was always something, I think like space, like humans have been driven by space curiosity from, from the, you know, from whenever we started to think. And so I am, I'm no different in that respect, but I was always very curious about what can I actually bring to the, to space? What can I find out about space? Um, and then quantum, again, I think, I think for some reason I understood quantum mechanics much better than classical mechanics. And that, that's something really hilarious because I did horribly bad in my classical ex mechanics examinations. I did not understand anything about that at all. Force diagrams, oof, I don't understand all that. But quantum mechanics made sense to me. Um, but also I think everyone laughs every time I say this, but I did come to physics because I love fantasy books. And I found that physics is actually like real, real world can sometimes be much more fantastical than what you read in books. And so wherever there's the fantasy and the mystery, I'm right there. <laughs> So, so very much a, a marvel of the space race. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, so, so obviously that that's from the the fundamental side. So, with with your business hat on, um, why 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 are why is um, taking quantum and AI to space um, important to both people as, as individuals and and businesses as well? That's a really good question. Um, so what drives me personally in this area is uh, how do we bring about a better future for humanity together? And we're all in it, businesses, governments, different kinds of stakeholders, individuals as public, individuals as people who are interested in their own futures, as well as driving uh, a sustainable economy. Um, so quantum, so, you know, the space race, the new space race, which has again started off this uh, recently, is kind of based on the fact that space has become a bit more accessible to people as opposed to only being the domain of really rich billionaires and government entities who have the money to be spending on huge space, mis space missions. And that happened because engineering also developed at the same time. So these tiny little satellites called CubeSats and nanosatellites, small satellites, which are basically a form factors like 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters cubes, which, are, which can be stacked on top of each other to form satellites which are you know, this big, uh, something like the size of a big cereal box, for example. And these were first built to enable students in Stanford to be able to get hands-on experience in satellite building. But soon uh, the space industry realized that these are really cost-effective ways of putting instruments in space. And we don't have to uh, rely on really big teams. We don't have to rely on government funding. We don't have to rely on extremely large amounts of money. And we also don't have to worry too much about all that money going down the drain when something fails. So this is what has driven the growth of a large amount of startups in the space sector uh, all over the world. Um, and Craft Prospect is one of those companies which is using CubeSats to augment technological developments in space, which will in turn help the development on the earth. Um, and so quantum is one of those technologies which has a very interesting history. So when we, I was doing my, PhD and masters and everything in quantum, I did not think that, I already knew that, you know, electricity is quantum, you know, it's electrons, uh, quantum particles, which are running all over us, all around us, lighting up our world. Um, and we were already kind of living in a quantum economy, but that quantum economy was the first, uh, first quantum revolution where we understood quantum as a theory, as an abstract quantum mechanical theory, we knew how to apply the theory, but we did not know how to manipulate quantum single particles. Now is a second quantum revolution, uh, which is again, you know, it's interesting because at some time, at some point, physicists tried to make, tried to drive forward quantum technologies and reach a wall. And that wall was because engineering had not progressed. We didn't, did not have the materials that we could use at that time to drive forward innovation in quantum technologies. Fast forward 10 years, and we have those materials now. And so the development of and the innovation in quantum technologies has progressed quite a lot again. Um, and this time we are able to manipulate single quantum particles. So particles which are less than 10 to the power minus 15 meters. We are able to manipulate them you know, at an individual level and we are able to use them to do wonderful things. So what quantum can help us do is either 
it helps us measure something which we could not measure before, see something which we could not see before, or it allows us to measure the same things we used to be able to measure before, but in a much more precise manner. Mm -hmm. And in both of these um, attributes, it gives us better information and better ways of uh, getting data and you know about our own world, which we can then use again to develop our world in a different way. So for example, quantum sensors, there's multiple different kinds of quantum sensors which, are, which have uh, found themselves uh, out in the world now. So they can be quantum images, they can be quantum brain sensors, which can detect different kinds of brain activities and so can be used to uh, augment the lives of people with autism, for example. Um, there are sensors which we can, which are actually I'm in a talk at some conference recently at Cambridge uh, City Council, I think. Uh, they are already starting to look at how do we in incorporate quantum sensors to figure out uh, how do we make our council a better, uh, how do we make our city a better place to be in? So water sensors, uh, we can use quantum sensors to figure out what is happening in the soil. We can use quantum sensors to figure out tiny different changes in the magnetosphere on Earth. So we can detect if there is a global um, uh, space weather event that's going to happen in the near future. And if there's a space weather event that happens, it will take out our whole power grids. And that's going to bring down our whole economy again. So it's very important that we prepare for these kind of um, events that are in the future, or even now, uh, by doing imaging, uh, by doing uh, gravimetry, for example, to find out where resources are there underground, for example. And specifically, what I work on at the moment in quantum is quantum key distribution. So we know that quantum computing is really, really interesting. It's going to open up a whole world of possibilities. Uh, quantum computers are going to be used to detect multiple different kinds of weather patterns, to optimize multiple problems and find their solutions, uh, solutions of which we couldn't find beforehand. But on the other side, they're also going to undermine our whole security, cybersecurity network that we have built all over the world. And especially in recent times with remote and COVID working, um, we are reliant on technology. We are reliant on our data being protected by cybersecurity companies. Now, quantum computers are going to be able to break those cybersecurity, which are based on um, RSA type algorithms on public key type cryptographic systems in less than a minute, which would have taken original normal computers uh, to calculate um, more than the lifetime of the universe. So it's important that right now we start thinking about the solution to that because we wanna be able to use the good aspects of quantum computing while protecting ourselves against the threat of cybercrime syndicates. So quantum key distribution is a quantum solution. There is another solution known as post-quantum cryptography, but that's not a quantum safe solution. It's going to be able to provide us security against quantum computers for many years in the future, but probably not for, forever. So it's important that we start thinking about future-proof solution, and that's where quantum key distribution comes in. And where does space come in? If we want to do terrestrial quantum key distribution, then I can only be I can only send a secure key. Uh, up to 500 kilometers, and that won't even reach you, John, you know, <laughs> so mu much less a global global internet, global quantum internet network. So the idea is that we are starting to build the global quantum ecosystem. And in order to go towards the global quantum internet, which protects everyone around the globe, and we are able to do global quantum uh, key distribution services, and so we protect everyone going forward together, we need to be able to form relays, and these relays are satellites for us. So we will be able to send keys down 500 kilometers in a LEO orbit to yourself. Then the satellite comes over to me, sends out another secure key. Then we do some complicated operations, find a common shared key, and we'll be able to have uh, encrypted communication, you, uh, encrypted by a quantum key, which would not be able to be eavesdropped by a quantum computer, right? So that's, what, that's where space comes in, to make it affordable, to make it accessible to everyone. And we use small satellites so that it's affordable and it's you know has a bigger risk appetite we are able to use small components that we find in the market we just buy them and we customize them and then we try and miniaturize 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 put make everything small and cute put everything in a cute fat and the first of its launch is going to be next year so i'm really looking forward to that fantastic and one of the things that that, that comes up quite often is um quantum nationalism or global collaboration and I think with space, it's one of the areas where it's fundamental because um, the, to, if you take the um, satellite relays, for example, oh, yes. uh, they they have to um, be available to um, 
uh, across across different nations. So, from 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 your vantage point, um, what do you see as the, the sort of the, the 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 current trends? Is it are we working more towards collaboration or more towards um, um, isolation or, or or strands of of each in between? Yeah, that is a very important as well as an interesting question. Um, I think there's a bit of everything at the moment. So obviously, when you know when these these kind of uh, technologies are early stage technologies, so when researchers researchers were developing them and taking them forward, there's always a wide collaboration among researchers everywhere in the world. Mm. Um, all of that technology, all of that know-how is always shared in term in in papers, in archive, and all that. Mm. Right. Um, also, if we want to introduce a quantum, if we want to develop the quantum infrastructure the, of the quantum internet of the future, one country would not, we have to standardize our competence. We have to standardize our hardware. We have to be able to talk to multiple different satellite networks. It's not going to be possible to do it only, you know, country centric. It has to be global. So I see a lot of collaboration going on in that kind of arena. There's a lot of bilateral agreements between countries and nations. For example, currently uh, we are we have built uh, one of the world's first quantum sources, the weak, a particular kind of quantum source, a weak coherent laser pulse source for CubeSats. Um, entangled photon source was actually built by uh, Spectral uh, a couple of years ago uh, in Singapore. Um, and we are building that source for our own satellite mission, which is coming up next year. But also we are uh, under the UK Canada bilateral agreement, we are uh, delivering that onto Canadian mission known as KeySat, uh, which is also launching next year on similar timescales. And so in the future, we also wanna be able to uh, link up rocks to the Canadian ground, ground system um, architecture and link up KeySat to rocks ground station, for example, as well as uh, look at uh, having inter-satellite links between rocks and KeySat. And so we are also talking to multiple other different companies who are all over the world at the moment, trying to look at these kind of collaborative um, interoperability exercises so that in the future, we won't have to design everything from scratch. It's much easier holding each other's hand and do. There's obviously complicated things like IP protection, for example, which countries want to do. And then there's complicated export laws that come into place when you're trying to send these kind of uh, technologies, sensitive technologies uh, abroad. And I think that this, this is a field that is rapidly growing and developing at the moment. Um, and I think people would have to find a middle ground between IP protection for individual countries, as well as figuring out where a handshake is much better. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, and then, and then if we, so rather than um, the, the complex nature of, of people, if we can come back to the, the more simple aspects of quantum and space and, the, the, the sort of the third part of this talk was around um, AI. So how, how does artificial intelligence um, really sort of stimulate the, the, the quantum space race, if you, if for want of a better term? So I think there's artificial intelligence can be, um, I guess, used in very different ways to augment very different parts of the quantum technology ecosystem. So because I work in QKD, I, I'm going to talk about how we use artificial intelligence for QKD at the moment. Um, so one of the biggest problems in delivering a quantum space key down to a ground station is if you have cloud cover. And especially in Scotland, we have a lot of clouds. <laughs> so 60%, <laughs> 70% clouds, uh, you know, cloudy skies over a year. Um, so it's important for us to understand how do we reduce overheads? How do we not waste a lot of orbits orbits when the satellite is going over the ground station, but it's unable to send down these keys because there is cloud cover, especially because quantum signals are quite weak and they would be, um, they would be uh, affected by lossy channels. Um, so we have a forward looking imager uh, as th this was one of the first products that Kraft developed, um, which is basically a lightweight neural network uh, deployed onto a hardware called the FPGA uh, and it interfaces into multiple kinds of sensors. So it could potentially be used for multiple different use cases, like earth observation, if you want to do, you know, cloud detection, fire detection, wildlife detection, um, night light detection, all of those kind of things. But we are going to use it for cloud detection uh, on rocks, our mission, which is coming up next year. 
So before the satellite goes over the ground station and forms a line of sight link, four minutes before that, the forward looking imager switches on. Um, it takes a look at the sky, at the night sky, because we will be doing nighttime QQD in order to make sure that the background light uh, does not prove to be another lossy factor um, in, uh, in our downlink. Um, so it looks at the clouds and the night sky. It takes a lot of pictures on top of the ground station before the satellite comes on top of it. And then it does classification of those clouds in orbit to find out whether that's clouds. If it does, flaunt, it does find that there's quite a lot of clouds uh, above a certain threshold, then it will take the decision of looking around, look, accessing geolocation data, and then figuring out if there's other ground stations nearby. If there are, then it uh, autom automatically uh, takes a decision of pointing the satellite towards a different ground station. And so downlinking the key to a ground station which is free from cloud cover or any other kinds of weird weather um, cover or um, jamming kind of, uh, um, or like, you know, physical device jamming kind of attacks, for example. Um, so this is, this is ensuring that we don't have to lose a particular pass. We can always use it uh, to the greatest efficiency. Um, also, another aspect of AI would be to monitor the security of the whole end-to-end um, -end, um, satellite system, because we, we, don't, we can't only take care of the QKD side of things. Yes, we are providing secure quantum keys, but then there's all these other things related to, is your whole supply chain secure or not? Uh, and that's where, again, AI can play a major role in uh, figuring out whether there are any attack surfaces which are exposed at the moment, um, and then it can give us an alarm or some kind of a, uh, alarm to say that, hey, the power monitor has actually been disabled. And so you're sending out uh, two photons or five photons instead of one photon in every pulse. And if we, if we are actually doing that, then it, uh, we, need to be, we need to know that because people could take away um, one photon uh, and then find the information from there. But if we are actually sending only one photon, then they won't be able to. Um, they will always leave, leave a trace if they are trying to eavesdrop. Um, so that's how we use AI. We also have a lot like a bunch of AI suite as a product of different kinds of AI softwares uh, that we provide to customers, which can kind of get around the bottleneck of the fact that your satellites, the, the downlink from satellite, you can only send so much data in so much time. So you want to be able to send the least amount of data, which is important. So the AI can kind of sort out the data, do some intelligent processing, compression, and then depending on what the end user's requirements are, it will downlink a particular um, kind of um, reordered, reprioritized data down. Um, I think in quantum computing, AI plays a very different kind of role. Uh, there's also a lot of AI algorithms which can probably um, uh, take advantage of a lot of quantum algorithms at the moment as well. So, but I'm not an expert in that, so I'll leave that topic to somebody else in the future. And so we've sort of spoken about the the, the science and the, the tech behind it, but in terms of applications, what do you see as the um, the, the sort of the, the either the, ne the um, most likely sort of near term or most beneficial near term, and also what are you most excited about with with what this technology may um, applications this tech these technologies may have moving forward. I'm excited about everything, <laughs> all the <laughs> applications that it could have. And just in particular, just like, you know, in general, uh, quantum is going to give us a lot more information about, about the world we are in. And we can use information, like information power. But also in QKD, for example, we are starting to build up the service segment. So what would a QKD service look like after we do the proof of concept demonstration mission next year? Um, then we have to solve the problems of authentication. How do we authenticate those keys? Uh, we have to figure out how do we um, use those keys in our current cybersecurity systems so that we don't have to like, you know, it's not practical to tell everyone, hey, just throw away all the cybersecurity systems that you have and then put a whole new one in a new place. It has to be uh, iterative improvements. So I'm excited to see the next, next step of ROCKS, which is the service segment. So it would include um, talking to many different kinds of stakeholders. So it will be financial, uh, like banks, it will be hospitals, it will be governments because they store the most vulnerable data in the beginning. Um, and it will also uh, include like signing up a constellation of satellites. So 
So in, and then the whole satellite have to talk to each other, like all of them. So that would be a smart constellation of satellites. You have to like plan out all of those scheduling or have some intelligent scheduling and automation. And on the AI side, basically, like it means that, you know, you have self self driving Ubers now. So this will be the beginning of self steering smart quantum satellites. It sounds so fancy, right? And exciting. Um, also, like once we are able to do these, you know, QKD based communications here, maybe we can take it further to do QKD based communications for the moon or something like that. So um, yeah, lots of exciting things coming up. But I think in the next three to five years, we're going to see uh, QKD being integrated into uh, actual services. So we'll, um, I'm quite excited about that. And um, we, we've, we've got some um, activity in the chat, but before we do that, I'd like to just just refocus on the um, the of, in your role as the the chair of New Voices in Space. Um, you know, I think this is something that uh, affects so many and, and is such a force for good. I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, what your role is, and, and if there's anything we can do to to help uh, support that. Yeah. Um... So my role in the New Voices, so I was one of the founding members and I'm the chair of the New Voices in Space. So I think the title is selected because we want to um, visibilize, vis visibilize and highlight new voices in space. And also there is, in the space sector, there is uh, quite a lot of, I guess, misinformation about the fact that who can be in space. There's astronauts, we know. We know, in, we know about astronauts. We also know about space scientists, you know, that's the term. Um, but we don't know that like the space ecosystem is built by so many people. You need engineers, you need scientists, you need project managers, you need marketing people, you need PR agencies, um, you need somebody who will be able to write. So like, you know, space speakers, space writers, space psychologies, um, space, um, I don't know, like farming and biological advances, um, space medical, you know, there's so many different kinds of professions. Space law is becoming very big. Um, so one aspect is to visualize the diversity of uh, careers that is available. The second is to visualize the diversity of thoughts that people that, especially in the UK, there is quite a range of diversity and ethnicity uh, that exists, but then that is not reflected in the space sector or the quantum sector uh, at, at this point. So we wanna make sure that that is there from, you know, from right from the beginning. Um, the, the space sector in the UK is like 10 years, 10 years uh, old, and it's not a bad time to start just making sure that, you know, that diversity of information is coming through. And diversity always leads to innovation. So that's the third, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, selfish aspect <laughs> to make sure that you want to have diversity in your, uh, in your ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, we run lots of competitions. We are uh, putting out an equality, diversity, inclusion guidance pack for uh, for companies in the space sector uh, to give them very, very strong uh, and practical tips on what you can implement in your workplaces. So the example I always give is there, there are these tiny little things that we miss out when, so first of all, 51% of the world is women. And for a long time, we have missed out 51% of our workforce. Imagine how much further we would have been if all of our workforce would have been involved in our decision making, in our innovation, in steering forward our future. But we haven't done that, but then better late than never. So let's let's get all of the women here. The second thing, and then after that, I started understanding the nuances of being in a queer community, of understanding how much this affects people in the intersection. So if you're a woman and you're belonging to the LGBTQ community, or you're disabled, or you come from, you know, uh, bad financial situations, all of that can lead to multiple different other problems in your life, which um, you were not aware of, or people in your workplace are not going to be aware of. And that is going to make you more vulnerable to microaggressions at work again. So for example, imagine that somebody is having abuse at home. And again, there's high correlation between which kind of demographics are more vulnerable to abuse at home. And then they are again juggling work and home life at the same time. And then if you don't have support for those kind of people at work to understand how to provide a safe space, for example, then you are going to lose those very talented people who would be able to bring a super interesting um, solution to your ecosystem, for example. Um, office temperatures, they, are, they have been set in the 1960s. They are uh, set according to a human a ma average male body. And that usually means that women, uh, you, you see women having like three or four or five jackets on the back of their chairs in offices. 
And that's because a woman's body, uh, the metabolism works at a higher temperature. And again, there are those tests before, which used to test for, you know, those stupid tests, which used to test for, are do women have the brain to do physics? So they found out that, you know, when you increase one degree temperature, there was a clear correlation in the increase of performance of women, you know? So there's all these little things that we don't realize. Again, like all of our architecture is built uh, for the dominant workforce previously, which was mostly like masculine, which was not disabled, which was not very inclusive, you know? Mm. Um, and we have really big doors. We did not have disabled access. And we had, you know, really high shelves, which short people cannot reach, for example. Um, but this will allow us to have a much more inclusive workplace, which allows everybody to feel empowered so that they are able to access the opportunities that's already there. I think everybody has enough enthusiasm. We don't need to like make people more enthusiastic. We need to be able to reduce those obstacles which stand in their way. Another thing I found out personally last year when uh, I actually lost the usage of both my hands for three months, and that was because of a repetitive stress injury, um, which then has led to fibromyalgia now. Um, but I found out that most of our keyboards and our mouse are built again to an average male um, uh, hand length palm length. And that means that women are more um, vulnerable to having a lot of these kind of uh, repetitive stress injuries, for example. So we are physically actually destroying women. We do not know that, but we are actually doing that very much by our design. Uh, bulletproof vests, they are again uh, built for uh, an average ma man. They're not built for short people. They're not built for women. They're not built for, you know, not your standard sized um, men. Uh, so it leads to 17% more women to die, for example. Same for car airbags. And, you know, you can find so many of these uh, in an amazing book uh, by, um, I'm forgetting the name, but it's called Invisible Women. Um, and I would highly recommend that book as a reading material. But then uh, I basically go to a lot of gender conferences. I get invited where uh, after three days of talking, like everybody has their expertise and everybody gives you a highlight into what they're working on and how this is affecting people in the intersection of vulnerable demographics. And my job is to kind of like take all of that together and show how everything is leading to each other. And that if we want to kind of understand how to build a better workforce for the future or just how to make a better work-life balance in the future, um, then we got to understand how everything interacts with each other. And that is important. That is not a side job. That is actually important because it is our job to make sure that our lives and our next generation's lives in the future actually gets better and not worse, right? You know, if you want to make make the best of our limited times, um, you know, on this earth, yeah. I, I assume we have a limited time. I'd be really happy if we actually get <laughs> out of our bodies and have these, you know, amazing super consciousness or something, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so so I, I like I like the um, analogy that it's, it's not so much down to, to appetite, it's the, it's the action um, or, or actioning that appetite um, and sort of, you know, maximizing the, the potential. I think that's a, um, you know, re a really, really good way of, of, of getting that positive action. Um, and I did promise that we wouldn't um, leave today's talk without mentioning Marvel and, and where that fits in. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm conscious there's lots of people in the chat, so I'm going to leave that as my last as my last point. <laughs> okay, so Marvel, right? I love Marvel, and I think I didn't I didn't used to like Marvel as much as a kid. And over the time, though, they have made like you know the fact that a really big organization, which actually has a lot of money behind it. Mm -hmm they have started to like expand their portfolio. They have started building up their female uh, characters, you know, the nuanced development of the 3D, nuanced development of those characters. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of like, they're tackling a lot of different kinds of issues. They have diversified is the, is the word. And that then gave me access to Marvel. I was like, oh my God, they were keeping this feeling from me in the, in the <laughs> past. And I love sci-fi. I love, you know, I love anything to do with cool gadgets and I love anything to do with, asking those big questions. And I think one of my favorite shows right now is um, the one on Disney Plus, What If? So basically it talks about like multiple parallel universes that might be existing um, beside our own. And, you know, all these different things that could change if one thing had changed uh, in those universes. So I think Marvel is just a great way of getting young people to start to dream about all these cool things. And the fact that they have actually made a conscious effort to diversify their portfolio and to ensure that everybody is being inspired and not just one kind of people are being inspired, that is giving me great hopes for the future again. 
Yeah, so a new a new turn of phrase for the or a new um, use for the for the phrase a modern marvel. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we've we've got some um, activity on the on the chat box that I'd like to to start to bring in. So, um, Doctor Anoop, um, if you're if you're able to, um, please please do take the mic and join us. Yeah, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yeah. So the question is, we are having a global year huge investment on quantum a cryptography based infrastructure. Uh, and the reason is that we are, uh, are fearing that in due course, when, if and when quantum computers are ready, they'll be breaking our encryption in linear time. Now, the alternative approach is that can we change our algorithms, which currently let's say is RSA based to something that which will take quantum computers even exponential amount of time. So the compared to like, we have two choices, either to invest in QKD based infrastructure or invest in post quantum cryptographic algorithms. So why would we currently invest on uh, QKD, let's say, rather than on uh, the other? Is there any theoretical barrier that prevents us from having algorithms or protocols, uh, security protocols that the quantum encryption protocols basically that the quantum computer would also take exponential amount of time to break? Uh, sorry, the last, last sentence, could you repeat that again? Yeah, is there any physics barrier or any fundamental thing that prevents us from making an encryption or decryption algorithm that would take even the quantum computers an right, exponential, exponential amount of time? Uh, that's a really interesting question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I'm not an expert in post-quantum cryptography, uh, but what uh, but i think the future is going to be hybrid of both post quantum as well as qkd i'm not sure if we can actually develop algorithms in post quantum which would take quantum computers an exponential time to break as well um, but that would be an interesting and i'm sure like people are starting to think about it or if not then you know your question is going to start that uh, thinking um but i guess the reasoning behind why people are already starting to develop qkd infrastructure is just that qkd um, provides you a way of always knowing if you have been eavesdropped, right? So I think that's the lure of QKD. Um, but also, I think it's widely understood that QKD cannot be a solution on its own right now. It has to be a hybrid solution uh, with post-quantum algorithms. And post-quantum algorithms already, like NIST, for example, is thorough uh, competition as well as standardization of what kind of post-quantum techniques should organizations already start applying in their uh, systems. So that's a bit easier um, to adopt those kind of solutions right now. Um, but yeah, the, the, the lure of QKD is more in the fact that if you have somebody trying to eavesdrop while you're sending down the key, then you will always, always know that there is an eavesdropper and then you'll be able to discard that key and use yeah, only one. A follow-up question to that was like, currently most of the security bridges are not based on uh, like uh, breaking the encryption but it is mostly based on like phishing attacks or other thing that kind of uh, affects the authentication of it. Right. So is there quantum, uh, is, does quantum magnets provide a solution to that in terms of authentication? Because currently those problems that exist currently, people are getting mm -hmm. hacked and all, that is still persist even with QKD because those are breaches of authentication and not cryptography. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, are, we have a project currently starting, uh, which is going to be looking into that. Um, and especially, I, we know that there is problems of authentication with QKD as well. And also, if you add a new node, for example, if you add a new ground node, uh, you have to authenticate that new ground node before it can be able to use a quantum key. So right. those are problems that we are currently looking at. I don't know the question. I don't know the answer to that, but hopefully we'll know in the next two to three years is the hope. Yeah, thank you for the answers. Um, and I Any did... good questions? Thank you. Um, and you know, whilst I'm not um, technical myself, I was on the um, a meeting with the Quantum Strategy Institute earlier, um, and one interesting takeaway from that was that that the comment that actually that that post quantum cryptography would be better labelled um, post your algorithm um, cryptography um, because what occurs as the quantum two revolution um, progresses uh, may be unknown. So that may be a, a slightly better way of, uh, of phrasing that. Um, and 
we, we, we also have um, Alexandra, uh, um, sorry, Alexander um, uh, posting um, a couple of questions. So Alexandra, if, if you'd like to come and join us. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, so um, my question was, uh, first of all, about the optimism um, with respect to um, universal quantum computers. Uh, right now, as I understand, the most amazing fact is that we did not hit any wall yet when increasing the size of our structures. And uh, I would uh, say that the main feature of the second quantum revolution is not as much as we can control single quantum particle as our ability to create a very large scale quantum coherence between a large number, macroscopic or mesoscopic number of particles. But we have uh, yet no guarantee uh, that we will not hit such a wall. You know, even Penrose proposed that we will have some uh, things related to gravity and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one possible stumbling block uh, on the development of this. And the second um, thing that I wanted and uh, to mention is that uh, even if, it, if there is no such fundamental barrier so far, there is no reliable way of uh, um, simulating and uh, characterizing large quantum structures. Uh, I we know about very optimistic plans uh, for developing, uh, uh, say, million qubit universal computers, but uh, I'm afraid that fundamentally you cannot uh, simulate more than a few hundred, maybe a couple of thousand, if we take, uh, if we employ all the uh, computational resources of this planet. And uh, so this uh, will be the next bottleneck. And uh, uh, so I, uh, my question was, what happens if we do actually run into this? Shouldn't we plan for this as well? Uh, shouldn't we kind of uh, qualify our mm. expectations? Um, not sure on the quantum computing side, um, because I don't work on quantum computers at the moment. Um, but when we are thinking about, but those are all very interesting points and, I'm, and they should be thought about right now. But I think people are quite excited that we have actually managed to build coherent large scale quantum structures and we have the materials to build them yeah. right now. Um, and that's great. Um, and I like the optimism, but yeah, let's think about the blockages as well. In QKD, uh, the dream of having a large network um, of constellations and high altitude platforms and, um, sh for example, able to provide keys to remote locations such as a moving uh, ship or an oil rig somewhere or, you know, having a fl plane flight somewhere. Um, there, are there are, again, problems here. Um, people are already starting to model those networks. Um, some, of, some of those networks are actually problems we, we can't solve. They're empty hard. Um, and so, some problems we already know, like it, when we have satellite-based uh, quantum communication, then they are also uh, vulnerable to jamming. So if, if, you have, if you jam on top of a ground station, then it's the same as any other kind of satellite signal, you wouldn't be able to get the key. So at the moment, how we are uh, um, thinking about this problem is because of the way we analyze and post-process our keys, we will download around, let's say, 10,000 keys per month into a ground station over, over a month. And then that gets stored in a buffer, um, which then gets post-processed at a suitable time, again, over a RF link with the satellite. And then as soon as it gets post-processed, it needs to be used up. Um, so you would always have a bank of these keys to rely on in case the satellite network is jammed. That's one, that's one problem that, that's one way people go around this problem. Um, but again, I think uh, we're starting to think of projects on how do we actually 
model those kind of problems? How do we mo model weather patterns so that we understand um, keys can go down properly? How do we model how the atmosphere looks like? There's like so many different kinds of variables at the moment, uh, which at the same time makes it really hard to come to a final service model all at once, but also I guess makes it exciting at the same time. And that is why collaboration is also key because everyone's kind of looking at a tiny little part of it. And then all of that has to come together. Um, but about your uh, about your worries about the coming to a wall in the quantum computing uh, arena, that, that is super interesting. And I'll go look at that. That's not my expertise. So hopefully somebody else will be able to answer you better on that one. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and just one uh, small question. Uh, you are planning to use uh, optical range communication with satellites, right? Yeah, so the quantum channel is optical. It's yes. on the near infrared. Uh, why not? Image. Why not microwave? Because we are using single photons to carry the information. In principle, theoretically, you could detect single the microwave photon. Mm. I think that so. Some of the things that so first of all, we were considering the fifteen fifty nanometer range. Um, uh, so that has been developed quite a lot. The technology here has been developed quite a lot due to LIDAR. So that has been used in LIDAR technologies. Um, and next to that, we found the technology that was easier, easiest to use are the optical ranges of the beam splitters, the, um, the dichroics that we're using, for example, uh, they're available for the 7, 700 to 850 to 905 range. So a lot of these decisions are taken in terms of what kind of instrument do we have available at the moment. Um, Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I'll think just, of what exactly we don't have in the microwave range now, but we'll look into it. Um, and just on the um, scaling of, of quantum computers, um, I'm going to sort of badly paraphrase um, one of my friends who's on the call, Rupesh uh, Shrivastava, um, who was who was um, has sort of asked questions around as you have an extra logical qubit um, and you know potentially double the the, the power of a quantum computer. Um, and it's past what can be simulated. Um, what's the, the, you know, how do you um, assess whether the results are correct? Um, and what's the kind of mechanism to um, use the, the, the data you receive from that? So um, not necessarily an answer, but maybe um, another string, another thread to that, um, to the, to that discuss, part of the discussion. Um, so, just on a slightly different um, track, um, Youssef was asking a question about gravitational waves. Um, Youssef, would you would you like to come and join us? Uh, yes. Hello. Can you hear me? We can do, Youssef. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is um, in this uh, quantum space, like when we uh, we have some uh, quantum communication. With photons, uh, what is the effect of um, of gravitational uh, waves and um, like uh, more generally the general relativity of Einstein? Because we know that, uh, for example, GPS take that into account, but it's not quantum. So can the quantum uh, communication uh, in space uh, has to take that into account, or it has no effect on quantum mechanics, uh, the gravitation? Uh, yeah, I mean, you still have to take into account the Doppler effect and the re redshift, for example, um, okay. as, as you do also in GPS signals. Um, but like, if you have quantum entangled communications, so we do single photon quantum uh, QKD, quantum key distribution, so we send single quantum particles, but then other people do entangled quantum key distribution. And you would be able to use quantum entanglement to um, to catch the effect of gravitational waves or just catch the effect of gravitational curvature um, on those kind of entanglement and figure out, and people are hoping that we will be able to send out two, two or three different satellites and have like, you know, entangled photons on each of these satellites and then see what the effect of gravitational um, curvature is on those uh, entangled photons. Um, I think there's also really interesting experiments planned uh, by using small satellites and quantum sensors and atomic clocks, quantum atomic clocks on them. So if you have like a huge swarm of small satellites and you have 
a range of quantum atomic clocks on these small satellites in the in the atmosphere or in, in Leo orbit or geo orbit, something like that. And then you have a range of uh, atomic clocks on the ground as well. If there's a wall of um, any kind of wave, so if it's a gravitational wave, but also like if there's dark matter um, or dark energy that passes through uh, these atomic clocks in space, and then it comes and passes through the atomic clocks on the ground. And then you will see that the atomic clocks on both places kind of have slightly different measurements, and that would be able to give you information on how these kind of particles or these kind of fields, which haven't yet been seen, have an effect on fundamental structure constants of our universe. Um, so there's a lot of applications of, you know, fundamental quantum technologies in scientific research as well in the future. Um, okay, thank you very much for the very nice uh, answer. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and then we had um, Alan asking um, a question about quantum teleportation. So, Alan, would you would you also like to, to come and join us? Hi, Mark. <clears throat> can you hear me? We can do. Yeah, no, I'm sort of studying sort of um, quantum entanglement at the moment, um, and sort of quantum teleportation is something that I'm sort of quite interested in and how that would sort of help in the secure communication. So quantum teleportation, how can it help in secure communication? Is that the question? Yeah, so that, um, you know, if you've got two endpoints, sort of Bob mm -hmm. and Alice, um, if Alice is sort of sending stuff um, via sort of a quantum teleportation, that would then be sort of more secure, really sort of um, with sort of entangled, yeah. with entangled particles. Potentially, yeah. But I think we need to kind of like uh, do like stable quantum teleportation of more than one particle um, and reproduce it before we can, I guess, use that practically. Yeah, so it's really just a sort of, a, um, sort of practicality that's sort of more of the issue than the technicality, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, again, yeah, uh, I, I don't think I'll be able to give you like a really good answer because I don't work on teleportation, but um, but I know that, you know, MyCS, the first, first satellite which yeah. demonstrated QKD, for example, they also demonstrated quantum teleportation uh, and that was using a single electron um, pair. Um, so, and have read good, a bit of articles where they are already looking at like multiple multiple particles in, uh, instead of like single quantum teleportation but we are i think far away from a solution where we can actually you know use that practically oh uh, fine okay thank in you anyway yeah but that is that is a super interesting field and i'm also looking out for what what developments are happening in that field oh thank you um and um avinash also had a, a question avinash if, if you'd like to come in and join yeah thank you so much uh, thank you dr sonali for sharing your uh, wonderful journey towards the craft of this uh, i have two questions regarding uh, uh, ai and AI hi, hi avinash um i think your microphone might be on uh, off sorry hello uh, can you hear me now it's, it's quite quiet I can, I can just you're just barely audible hello yeah i mean we can hear you Avinash, but barely but it's fine you can go ahead i think oh okay okay thank you uh, so I, i'll speak a bit louder so my question is regarding uh, is that availability of service is always a concern because uh, you mentioned that you're going to use lightweight neural networks uh, in fpga mm. Uh, in order to uh, classify the clouds and send it to other ground station. If we wanted to send the QKD to the exact ground station, is it always yeah. a concern? And my second question is, did you come across any specific problems that can be solved by machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, during your uh, uh, experiments? Uh, uh, that, uh, I, yeah, the big... can get benefited. Yeah, Thank you. Right. So the network problem is a big problem. Like what is the best way of distributing keys 
uh, if you have a network of N ground stations and a network of M satellites, for example. Um, that's a big problem that would be great if can be tackled by AI. Um, at the moment, I think there's very rudimentary uh, calculations on the network problem. Um, second thing is, um, oh, sorry, trying to remember your first question. Uh, yeah, okay, so is availability of service always a, uh, yeah. I mean, any kind of satellite service is kind of uh, dependent on multiple different factors. Uh, especially in quantum, because the signals are so weak at the moment, yes, it is a concern if there are clouds on top of a ground station. So already in our characterization and post-processing and in figuring out which orbit we need to be putting the satellite in, we take into account whether uh, on top of the ground stations, we take into account whether in that particular orbital uh, path. Um, and yeah, so that will continue to be a concern until we figure out a way of kind of like, how do we increase the power without making it more than one photon, for example, can be a bit challenging, I guess. And, and I must apologize, my volume was a little bit low there, Avinash. So, Sonali, uh, uh, the second question, did you come across uh, any specific problems uh, while doing this? That can yeah, it's a network a problem. problem. So how do you, how do you solve uh, the network traffic problem of having, like, let's say, M number of satellites, which, uh, and then how many of these satellites should be connected to how many ground stations exactly, so that you have a very efficient key distribution mechanism. And that would be slightly different to classical network problems uh, because of the unique properties of you know, quantum um, and how, how those photons are going to be distributed and how the X, XOR, um, you need to do an operation to ensure at the end of the day that you have a key. Uh, you also need to be able to do a, a extra post-processing at the end over a classical channel. So you have to have one quantum channel and one classical channel between a ground station and a satellite. Um, and then you would need to have like inter-satellite connections. You would need to have like connections maybe between ground stations as well. But uh, then there's the problem of, do you trust all of these nodes or do you not trust all of these nodes? Then how do you make sure that you are performing authentication and which kind of um, uh, protocol would you need to be able to use in the ground stations after you have put in the quantum keys. So a lot of these problems are unsolved, like haven't been solved at the moment. Um, I don't know if machine learning is going to be the best way of solving this, but it could potentially be. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. and. Um, yeah, I guess another way of getting actually around the cloud problem is if we increase the frequency uh, quite a bit of the optical communication. Um, and I think people are also looking into that. So at the moment, we are going between 100 to 200 megahertz. Um, but I think in the near future, uh, according to the roadmap, uh, quantum roadmap, you would want to go another order of magnitude high um, and then another order of magnitude high. And then that would uh, take care of some of the problems that currently QKD is facing. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Um, and Arup, um, it looks like you wanted to, to ask uh, an, another question. So Arup, um, if, if you'd like to join us. Uh, yes. So you briefly mentioned about uh, uh, the like key banks. In case the link doesn't work out, there is a cloud cover link breaks, you can use the key banks. The whole idea seems like we can generate keys beforehand and then distribute it. But isn't that, uh, if we could do that, then can't we do that on a tabletop experiment, generate them, keep them in bank and distribute whenever we need? So no, but yeah, I mean, that, that is a very interesting question. But the difference here will be that when you're distributing the keys, that is, mm -hmm. the, that is an attack vector. That is the point when somebody will be able to eavesdrop. So satellite QKD gets around this while when, whenever you are actually sending the keys down, then you always know if a raw key has been eavesdropped on. But before you actually use the key, so right before you use the key, you would do extra post-processing to amplify the security and get the final key. So you wouldn't even be storing the final keys before you use them. So okay. there's a, yeah, there's a couple of different. So, 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 so okay, you don't store the keys. So you don't store the key as such, you just keep the raw data and you do the like basis matching afterwards. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there can be multiple parts where you would choose whether to do the basis basis matching at what point. 
Um, but like, depend if you want to like, because you want to do finite key analysis, you would need a huge bank of raw, raw key already stored so that you can do the post-processing efficiently as well. You wouldn't be able to do that if you have like a very low amount of raw key. Okay. And the follow-up question regarding uh, the entangled photon source a distribution of a satellite was that uh, none of the sources go up to 100% heronic ratio. So they're not true pairs as we kind of theoretically analyze. So now every such practical implementation would have is associated with error rates and uh, the, I mean, the security is lowered because these are not genuine true single photon source. We have to live with a certain heralding ratio. And this also, I mean, of course we can do coincidence measurement, but then uh, to filter them out, like to get the true single photon is, but how do you synchronize multiple devices such far so that uh, we select the coincidence pairs only and can't if modify those classical signals? I'd have to apologize. I don't work yet on the entangled photons as well. So we use okay. weak coherent laser pulse sources. Okay. And at the moment we um, phase randomize um, the sources and then we ensure that we uh, attenuate the output of the sources so that it's less than one photon on average uh, output per laser in pulse. Which in which time scale basically? Like mean photon number is one within which time scale? Uh, over, I don't know, like uh, nanoseconds, is it? Yeah, yeah, nanoseconds. So mm -hmm. each pulse, like the difference, the temporal difference between each pulse is around one nanosecond or 10 nanosecond. I can't mm -hmm. remember at the moment, but it's nanosecond scale. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then we also have a power monitor, which will then um, look at the output of those uh, laser pulses and then give us the reading so that we can be sure that we are producing less than one um, photon uh, on average. Mm -hmm. um, okay. On so it's a decoy state protocol. protocol. It's a sorry? Decoy state protocol. It's the decoy state protocol, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Spectral in Singapore, as well as RAL space in the UK, uh, both of them do entangled photon, QKD. And the way the um, space QKD uh, ecosystem in the UK works is the government kind of gives different kinds of grants to different kinds of companies so that it kind of builds all the different uh, ways of doing QKD at the same time. So we do single photon, but obviously not true single photon sources at the moment. Um, and then RAL space does entangled photon, then over the UK Singapore bilateral collaboration, Spectral also does um, entangled photon in Singapore. Yeah, thank you and for the detailed Canada, answer. Yeah, Canada also does entangled photon, but they're also using okay. our single photon sources to do decoy state as well on their satellite. Okay, okay thanks for the detailed answer. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Really interesting. So you need to have calmed down a bit now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'll just come back off of mute and, and, and thanks for, for all of the answers as well. That was um, a fantastically wide ranging. Um... No, I think thanks for the questions. They were, I, I think there are some questions which I haven't like thought of as well. So I need to go back and think about them. And that's the, that's the best part about having those questions and doing those talks, you know. Yeah, and I, and I think there, there was a lot about entanglement. So the, the title of the talks is obviously. Um, yeah, that's, with... that's the next two, three years on our roadmap, but it seems like I need to go back and start, you know, start brushing up my knowledge on that again <laughs> now. <laughs> well, well you're, always, you're always welcome back on Entangled Discussions to talk about future work. And um, yeah, thanks thanks for, um, for for all of the answers and all, all of the insights. And um, I know there's a lot that, that I'm going to need to watch back and, and try and unpack as well. So um, it, it's been a real pleasure, real pleasure speaking today. Um, and, you know, I, I, can't, I can't wait to, to come back at the end of the month where we'll have all of the, the month's um, speakers back for a true Entangled discussion. Um, but before then, um, next for next week's talk, um, we return at the same time where Malak Trebelsi Loeb, um, who was our final guest, will discuss the unifying themes of diplomacy for the new space age. Um, as mentioned at the start of the talk, um, we are changing the way we administer these talks slightly. So just to keep up to date and up to speed with all of the talks as they as they move forward, um, please follow um, Entangled Positions um, on LinkedIn and, and we'll keep you abreast of that. But um, once again, thank you so much for um, for everything today, Sonali. It was um, it's a real pleasure and a really wide ranging talk. So lots to think about.
a real pleasure being here, John. Thanks so much for the invite and thanks everyone again for the question. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Take care.